and um, love the title, Focusing on Polycentric Institutions of, uh, of Intimacy. And I'm looking forward to just a fantastic, just a fantastic discussion here. Um, Jamie, do you need anything from us before we get going here in just a second? I don't think so. I already checked my share yeah. screen works and I've got just a, a very short PowerPoint, but I wanna keep it short. So I, there's as much time for discussion as possible. Oh, of course, of course. Well, no, that sounds, that sounds great. And, um, and there's just a quick reminder to everybody. We do have a couple of other events uh, going on this week, including in the Data Salon series at two o'clock, we have Shoshana Zuboff, um, the author of Surveillance Capitalism, who will be giving kind of a special talk and leading a discussion. So of course, it'll be available on the YouTube channel afterward. But if you happen to be free, you know, at two o'clock, I would like to beam in, you know, check out the flyer. I'm happy to find a link as well. Um, and then this Wednesday, we have Laura um, Calloway from, from the Letty School talking about her work on investigating privacy concerns and risk perceptions after a year of COVID, though at this point, we might need to revise that title, um, Laura. So <laughs> given that it seems like this is never ending at this point. But Jamie, could not be more excited to feature you in the colloq. Um, and over to you without further ado. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um... Here is my PowerPoint. Does that look good to everybody on uh, on your end? It looks right. great for my end. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, it's really exciting for me to be able to present um, at this colloquium today. I've been studying the work of Eleanor Ostrom and Vincent Ostrom for some time now, but without and, you know, of course, I have Paul Alajika as a colleague down the hall, Bobby Herzberg, who's been wonderful in giving me advice, but I haven't really had a chance to converse with all of you who are actually there at the workshop nearly as much as I would like to. So I'm up at, interested, of course, in any comments or discussion um, around the paper that might be helpful in building this program, but I especially want to know if I've gotten you know, if I've missed important opportunities to connect to the work of the Ostroms, if there's something where I've uh, neglected to include important advancements or to really um, deal with appropriately, I I'm really interested in the feedback from all of you on that. Um, so the goal in this project, I've been working on women's rights in American history for some time. Um, and Viviana Zelizer came to George Mason University and delivered our um, I can't remember if it's every one year or every two years, but we have an Ostrom speaker series. So we have these speaker series that are named after uh, scholars that we particularly admire. This one is, is named after Eleanor Ostrom and um, Viviana Zelizer, who's, you know, she's very important in the world of economic sociology and just her comments about Eleanor and Eleanor's work and how important she thought it was to understanding social reality just could not have been more glowing. And she highlighted so many connections that she saw between her work and this institutional analysis approach. Um, so I really wanted to, to dive into that because I'm, you know, in presenting this work on institutions and how they, uh, or rather the institutions of family law and how they have shaped uh, life it's something that after studying this for a while, I see as, I just see it everywhere. You know, it's like, you know, once you've seen, you know, the flaw in the wallpaper, you always see it. Um, but it's something that I'm always working on trying to really test and, and push and kind of bring people, bring other people into that conversation of if these institutions around family are so important, how do they connect to kind of broader political and economic institutions? And how can we really understand the, the widespread uh, impact that these have had, these institutions have for life around the world? Um, so I think this kind of connected lives institutional approach might be exactly what I need to kind of push that idea forward. Um, and Zelizer and Ostrom both are just wonderful examples, I think, of scholars who deal with a really complex topic that they are intentionally not shying away from the complexity of it and they are trying to deal with it in its full messy reality but they are doing that but but also at the same time giving us you know a pretty clear framework a context a structure to put that in so it's complexity but with some kind of guide so you don't just get totally lost in it um 
And so the, in terms of the kind of applied empirical case I offer in this paper about the, the mingling of intimacy and money, um, I think when we take this connected lives institutional approach, we don't have to deny the fact that money and love can have really bad interactions, but it's not because of the objective reality of those two behaviors or of those two sets of objects. It's instead because of the institutional context that they exist within. Um, and so hopefully through this, we, I, you know, in this paper, I have tried to build out this more connected lives rather than hostile worlds approach. The hostile worlds, of course, referring to the idea that intimacy and economic considerations are just always going to go badly. There's always going to be oppression, exploitation, abuse, and, and these just can't combine in ways that are actually um, mutually beneficial for the people involved. Um, I'll go briefly through this. this, this um, these two slides are basically section two of the paper, so I won't belabor it because I know many of you probably will have read it already. They both reject this hostile worlds approach. You know, Eleanor famously emphasized um, that we cannot put very much in the social world into two neat little boxes. So it's not private or public, it's not market or state, it's not hostile or excellent. It's just, it's always a question of the institutional specifics. They both really centralize rules and specifically an understanding of rules as only being intelligible through some kind of shared meaning between the people who are involved in that rule system. They both really centralize that. So Zelizer talks about objects only gaining their, their significance, their meaning through rules they exist within. And I think this pairs nicely with Eleanor's, Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom's emphasis on the importance of recognizing what the rules in use are. So in order to understand the objects and activities around us, we need that understanding is only gonna come through a recognition of what people believe the rules that they are interacting under to be. Um, both frameworks recognize that there are multiple rule systems available to particular people. Um, these could be overlapping rule systems. They could be bordering. You could be only allowed to access one or the other depending on what your, your role or status is. And so understanding the nature of the interaction between those rule systems is also just as important as the rules themselves. And so I think this is why, at least I framed it in the paper as this being the reason why boundary and scope rules are so essential in both programs, because they tell you which rules apply to this circumstance, this relationship, this interaction. Um, both frameworks also emphasize that rules are defined as they are enforced. So it's also in the process of trying to put the rules into practice that people get the opportunity to renegotiate what those rules should be, what the rules actually are and mean. Um, and this is the opportunity also to change the rules in response to different circumstances, new problems that are being faced, changes in the institutional environment. And so I think this is why, you know, I think these four commonalities are, are the shared background that leads both of these scholars to develop frameworks that have a lot of analogs. So on the one hand, Viviana Zelizer has this idea of circuits of commerce. The Ostroms have this idea of polycentric governance. Mike McGinnis wrote to me and suggested maybe that an action arena might be a more appropriate analog to circuits of commerce than a polycentric system in its entirety. So I'd be really interested in any discussion um, or, or any, any thoughts on whether I have exactly the right analog here. Um, but either way, uh, both frameworks, they kind of give the social scientists this way to understand that a social system that seems to lack direction can actually be coordinated through bottom-up negotiation as people respond to the tensions and problems that arise in society, or in this case, in their personal relationships. Um, so the reason why we need a, an institutional approach if we wanna have a discussion about gender and family law 
is that this connected lives institutional framework helps us understand both what is common and what is particular about institutions. So what I, what I mean by that is it's a way to look at what are those shared meanings that are guiding people to act in particular ways, to enforce particular rules or to anticipate enforcement. And also what is particular in the sense that maybe a rule applies to you, but it doesn't apply to me. So we can also understand kind of those differences in the institutional environment that people face according to what their social role is um, or the, the type of activity they're involved in. Um, of course, we know across the world, most societies have rules that do vary depending on relationship status. Um, extreme examples in the domain of gender and family law are you know, engaging in sexual activity with the wrong person that could be, you know, face a sanction that's anywhere from embarrassing to potentially a death sentence if you are, you know, living in a culture that extremely penalizes um, sexual activity out of wedlock or, or something like that, or, or with the wrong person, you know, homosexual relationships. Um, so there are pretty significant um, variations in rules according to who you are, what kind of activity you want to engage in. Um, Zelizer gives us this nice example of gifts, that the same gift might be incredibly appropriate to give to your wife, incredibly inappropriate to give to one of your undergraduate students. Um, so, you know, these kinds of these, th this is an illustration of a way in which these rules kind of connect really clearly to the, the object, objects and activities that we interact with in daily life. Um, another reason why I think this connected lives institutional approach is so um, significant and important for discussing gender and family law is that even though these marriage relationships are often the most intimate that uh, intimate form of relationship that might exist in a society, you know, the, the family as a whole, however that's constituted um, in that social circumstance, it's, that doesn't mean that it's isolated from the rest of the community and the other families around it. So sometimes our most intimate relationships can also be the ones that outside parties are most interested in policing. Um, so there are a lot of or else's involved in how we form families and the and how we interact with each other within the family unit. Um, so this is this gets to Zelizer's idea of third parties acquiring um, strong investments in other people's relationships. And there are many reasons for this. Um, one of them is that if we think of the family as the most fundamental political unit, it then becomes a sort of social foundation that other people in that society often develop an interest in maintaining. Um, and so I didn't, uh, I didn't bring it into the PowerPoint here, but I think this could possibly be a connection to Ostrom's work on co-production in the sense that the family, families in a community might co-produce what those core you know, building blocks of social relationships look like and how they're governed. Um, okay, so just uh, a few words on, the, on this historical case of the doctrine of coverture. So um, the doctrine of coverture uh, dates back to um, Catholic law. It gets into the United States through Anglo-American institutions. So it winds up having an influence on the governing law in Britain from about the 10th or 11th century, gets transported over um, to the United States through British settlements here. And the doctrine of coverture, it, it's based on the biblical idea of man and wife becoming one. And they take that as a literal legal truism. So a husband and wife, be, have a single legal identity. Um, since Britain is a patrilineal society, or depending on which aspect of it you're looking at, you might call it a patriarchal society. I, I think that would be uncontroversial. They wind up pairing that idea of the man and wife being one with the idea 
that the man is the head of household and as such should be the legal representative for all economic decisions that are made. So what this does is it leaves married women without the ability to own property, without the ability to keep earnings. They can get involved in business, but their husband can come along and legally kind of blow everything up at any time he wants if he decides he doesn't like some decision that she's making. Um, so it really severely constrains um, women's ability to engage in economic activity and their ability to secure any kind of economic independence, especially when we remember this is a historical time where supporting yourself as a single person would have been extraordinarily difficult. Um, so if we apply the, the Zelazar and Ostrom to this conversation about coverture, I think one of the things that gets revealed is that part of the reason why love and, you know, that, I, I don't know if we, calling it love is maybe too specific, but because, you know, you, you can be in a, a marriage that's not a, a loving relationship, but in these very intimate relationships, the reason why it winds up generating the circumstance of economic dependence for women is not because marriage needs to be that way or intimate relationships need to be that way, but it's because these marriages were formed under the doctrine of coverture. So this specific institutional environment created a situation in which women were held effectively hostage within their intimate relationships because of the, the variety of ways in which economic independence, any possibility of economic independence was denied to them. Um, another example, this is from the 20th century. So this is um, after coverture has mostly declined, but um, of course left its, its shadow um, in, in ways that exist explicitly in law up until the 21st century, which you know there were still marital rape exemptions in United States legal codes until 2005. So it left a very long shadow. Um, but this idea of separate spheres, that any interaction in public life requires a, a particular um, masculinity, almost a kind of violence or aggression, that, that there's no way to couple being feminine or engaging in domestic work with any kind of public life um, really comes out in all of the propaganda around the suffrage movement in the early 20th century. So these are um, different propaganda art pieces, comics, um, posters that were created. So you see this, like, like, look how tiny this gentleman on the right here is compared to his gigantic wife who's just holding him down by the head and berating him because She's joined suffrage, so now she, you know, she's she's destroying what the proper relationship should be. She's transgressing these boundaries, um, th and this is something that emerges because family law created under the doctrine of coverture, paired with a particular set of institutional rules that were um, enforced within the household and between households, and now as the meta as, as the political rules of the society are changing, but the family rules, the community norms have not changed yet. There's this tension between two sets of rules that do not cohere. They're inevitably in tension. So then there is this period of tension until renegotiation in families and communities happens to kind of change those norms to, to bring those two institutional sets back into some degree of coherence. Um, so I'll, I'll give just one last example and then I'll wrap up here so we can turn to the discussion. Um, but I think all the time of this example from Viviana Zelizer's work, it's this top quote here on this slide. Um, this is from a, a Mexican immigrant family where after they immigrate to the United States, the woman begins to work outside the household for the first time ever. She always had done exclusively domestic work in the household. And when they were living in Mexico in that circumstance where all of her work was domestic, she felt that she was not allowed to say no to sex ever. And after she begins to work outside the home, she instantly it becomes clear to her 
that there is a dissonance that if there's going to be if they're going to be economic partners who are freely interacting that they need to be intimate partners who are freely interacting as well so she she kind of she describes it as kind of like getting up this courage to feel like she can tell him no because she supports herself now so i think this it this framework i think gives a lot of insight and logic into how it is that our economic dealings and the political and economic systems that we live within can shape the nature of even our most intimate relationships. So I think it, it pushes this idea of all the institutional systems of a society, all the rule systems being connected in significant ways. I think it really pushes us to consider that seriously um, in, in conversation about even our most intimate relationships. Um, so I'll, I'll end with this quote from Ostrom, when the world, we are, Eleanor Ostrom, when the world we are trying to explain and improve, however, is not well described by a simple model, we must continue to improve our frameworks and theories so as to be able to understand complexity and not simply reject it. So if our current frameworks are not leaving room for us to understand why economic activity and intimacy work so well together sometimes and wind up being so destructive or unproductive at other times, then what we need to do is continue to develop the framework, allow for more complexity to enter the theory until we can understand that. And so I think hopefully this connected lives institutional approach can then push us to a little bit more nuanced uh, understanding, a nuanced set of ways to think about um, money within intimate relationships. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really, really, really well done. Such an important topic and, and presented in a really, really compelling, you know, thoughtful way. So excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, guys, I'm sure there's, there's so many, you know, questions, comments that have, that have come to mind as you've been listening to Jamie here. Um, oh, and I see there's a few folks in the Oyster Room. Sorry. I thought we were totally virtual, so sorry for not being down there. <laughs> but help me out, okay? Help me out if we missed if, if I'm missing any you know hands going up in the room there as well. I think I see Eaton and, and maybe a few others. So, um, so excellent. Thank you so much again, Jamie. Who, who'd like to uh, you know kick us off with question, question, comment for Jamie? I just had a really quick one, Jamie. Kind of what, what got you interested in this in this intersection and this topic to begin with, if you don't mind me asking? Was this a kind of a part of your research agenda for some time now, or is this kind of a new, um, you know, a, a new effort? Um, no, it's been a part of my research agenda for a while. I wrote my dissertation on women's economic rights in American history. Oh, fantastic. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. And and so I've been interested. Mm -hmm. um, for a while in the way that the industrial revolution changed the opportunities that were available to women, not just economically, but also in terms of did they, did they have to get married? Could they choose to enter a different kind of partnership? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of started for a while, uh, you know, for some time I've had this intuition that it's not an accident that we have centuries of coverture, centuries of married women being denied these basic economic rights. And then that starts to fall apart within about 30 years of the Industrial Revolution. You know, and I don't think that's an accident. So, so I've been thinking for a long time about this subject in different ways to approach the question, which but it's not uncontroversial. You know, I didn't, you know, it was such a short presentation. I didn't have a I didn't take very much time to get into how controversial some people might find this thesis, but I think the idea that um, routes to economic activity can be a, a vehicle for personal liberation, I think a lot of people find that very contentious because many people view particularly industrialization and like a waged employment model as something that's more likely to be supportive of um, limiting your opportunities, um, making it, making you more vulnerable to oppression. And the, the narrative that I'm offering basically implies the opposite because it, it's still, it's such a great expansion of opportunity relative to what existed previously, even if it's not perfect. So I, I think that's part of the, the motivating interest. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, Jamie. Yeah. Well, Hey, as the, as the father of three daughters, again, <laughs> such, such, such compelling work and you put it in such great historical context. I, I know Jamie Carini, you have a number of questions you said as well. So yeah, no, feel free. Let's kick off with one of those and I'll keep the, the, uh, the cue going. And I see Diego raising his hand as well, but Jamie, please. Yeah, no, Jamie, I just really like, I, I'm a fan of your work, as you know, <laughs> and I've been fascinated by your engagement with this topic. Um, and to, it's, to learn more about it today has been really cool. Um, and especially because it's so complex. I mean, you you were talking specifically about maybe the rub between these two institutions of money and, and family is where some of this tension comes from. Um, and that's a question I've like been examining too in, in some of in some of my own work, you know, is do some of our, our issues arise from this institutional rub where they're not compatible? Um, I wonder, so as I was, I was taking lots of notes and one thing that I was wondering as you're like going through like a very short history of coverture in the United States <laughs> is how, um, how it, you know, I suspect that like, different issues of the time influenced the way coverture developed as well. For instance, like the, the, the images of the suffragettes made me think of, you know, like family life being influenced by Victorian England, for instance, you know, where we know that um, the role of the family becomes really important as, you know, Americans are modeling like Victor like the marriage of Vic Vic uh, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. I'm not just Americans, but England uh, English as well. And in France, we also see like this emphasis on the family being really important and key to that to developments of nationalistic sentiments. So I wonder if that's at play in like early 20th century America. Something else that I've been grappling with too in 16th and seven uh, excuse me 17th and 18th century America. So the 1600s 1700s. Um, is, is something that has like sparked my interest just from looking at like family history um because some of my family were like some of the early english settlers and they and they left wills behind and what we see is that women inherit like they don't inherit as much as men but the daughters are inheriting from their fathers and i think i've been wondering if that's an innovation actually because you know in england because of the emphasis on primogeniture of the sons inheriting everything I wonder if this period in American history actually opens up opportunities for women, even if a little bit, because we see them being named in wills. Um, they don't get as much as the sons, but they do get they do get a share, and the and, and their fathers thought about this. Anyways, lots of thoughts. Um, how would you respond? I'm curious in your response to the question of like women in particular inheriting in early in America. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that was interesting legally about the United States in the, you know, in the first 50 years of its existence, maybe even longer, um, is the question, what did formal law even look like? You know, if you're living in, uh, did your family live in the Northeast along the seaboard, I imagine? Yeah, Nantucket Island, um, Mass Massachusetts, uh, Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Colony, um, Rhode Island, all of those states, yeah. So they probably had easier access to, to courts and to formal mechanisms of governance. Some parts of the country, like if you lived in the territory of Ohio in 1810, or this, it would be a state by then, but if you lived there, you might see a judge twice a year. They would literally ride horseback through the state. And, and so what this means is that if you don't have quick access to that legal enforcement, you sometimes have to come up with a self-enforcing solution that you can um, navigate on your own. So there was this legal vehicle called um, the separate estate that was created in the United States in the early 19th century. And what it was, it's, it's kind of exactly what you describe. It's a way for fathers to ensure that their daughters are able to keep some portion of the family property, regardless of how much of a CAD their husband winds up being. So you might just be talking about a father giving to an unmarried daughter, which could be even less legally complicated, although, although like you said, maybe not quite as, as common um, in England in the century prior. Um, but that, and that was one thing that a father had. So, so two things, that's something that a father had a right to do that a mother would not. So a mother could not write a legally enforceable will. Um, and then the kind of the second issue is, so if he grants his daughter the property, what happens to it after she gets married without this kind of separate estate vehicle, 
that would, it would become her new husband's property, unless it's something small and personal, like dresses, something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously I can't speak to details without looking at it, but there were some kind of new legal devices being created. And I do think this is a response to changing institutional circumstances, you know, lack of access to formal law um, and a relatively egalitarian economic structure compared to what existed in Britain. Can I follow up real quick? I'm sorry, I know you've got a cue, Scott, but oh, yeah, yeah no, on. just, no, Jamie, that's so interesting. Ah, shoot, let's see, what's the thought? Just the idea of this, sometimes I wonder if us in the 21st century looking back, we see things as limitations, where in fact, I wonder if people at that time were, you know, even saw these as opening up as well. I mean, obviously the complex is, uh, the context is complex, but these are also conversations I've had with Erwin, De Erwin Decker recently as well. Like, um, it's, yeah. So, to be continued. Oh, sure. And I'm sure we'll have time to look back to you as well, Jamie, because I don't want to cut that conversation short. I did just want to briefly mention, too, before we move on, Jamie, that if you, if you might already be in touch with plenty of legal historians, but um, back in back when I was in law school, I was the RA for Larry Friedman. I'll, I'll put his, um, his uh, link in the bio. Still really active. Obviously, one of the more, most prolific writers on the history of American law, and just a really wonderful guy to chat with. So, if you're not already in touch, happy to put you guys, you know, in um, in connection. You can talk about his most recent detective fiction as well, which is also pretty fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I have definitely read some of his work. He's very excellent. So that that's awesome. You, know, yeah, you don't yeah. think these people that you could potentially reach out to? Yeah, of so course. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll make that happen after we're done. Um, so, okay, great. So I think Diego was next, if I'm not mistaken, and then, and then Brian, and then we'll go to the Oyster Room. Yeah. Hello, Jamie. Congratulations. Very interesting topic. Um, and I was wondering two things. First of all, one related to the culture, like uh, how do you see the relation in terms of a culture affecting the law? Like the, in many cultures, the woman has to be in the house and has to be relegated to those kind of things. And that is translated to the law. And which are your thoughts about how this could change uh, in the future? And the second is about uh, your thesis about the money affects the, the relation and these kind of things. I was wondering if you have able to do some cases study I just remember that my wife was uh, working in Colombia with a foundation and they specifically said that like when the woman ha have a monetary independency or economic independency, the full thing is changed. I'm not sure if they have any kind of uh, real analysis of that or it's just the marketing, but I guess that should be uh, or should, could be interesting. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts of that. I am copying the, the link, Jason. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, so how does coverture affect love? It was part of the question, I, think, I believe. Yeah, coverture, yeah. And so oh, culture or coverture? So, culture, like. Cover. Okay, they, yeah. I think, so there's um most, uh, of course it's complex. There's no way that you can sum up what every intimate relationship actually looks like. Um, but most historians agree that um, love was definitely not as valued as an important characteristic for a marriage in the era of coverture, especially if you were in a social circle that had wealth that was actually of, of a level worth transferring. So, you know, maybe it didn't matter so much how you chose your partner if you were both going to be just working to survive your whole lives, but especially among classes where there was, where property ownership was a significant concern. And I think this is where the trope, if you watch like a period drama, how scandalous it is that a young woman would choose to marry for love rather than based on, you know, the, the gentleman's economic bona fides. It, it has some grounding in historical reality in the sense that this is just people did think of marriage as more of a uh, kind of a forming of a productive unit that was important for survival. We now, at least in the 
So not in the whole world, but in, in many parts of the world, there are now countries where you can have just a fine life. You can earn just as much money as a, a single person as you could um, with a family potentially. So that's no longer as essential. So this is often described as the shift um, to a companionate ideal of marriage. The idea being that now you are just picking somebody that you wanna spend a lot of time with. Um, and there's debate over whether this um, contributes to divorce rates, whether it's a bad thing that this contributes to divorce rates, um, but either way, when you don't have to make your decisions based on how you will be treated economically, which women more or less had to do in an environment where they could not uh, maintain themselves as independent persons, um, then love, affection cannot be the sole you know, uh, criteria you'd use to, to pick that person that you wanna be spending all that time with. Um, so yeah, I think this idea of, like, I, I know this is um, a really, I think it's a really important conversation in development is in places where there is maybe the practical opportunity for women to gain economic independence, but the culture has not quite caught up to that yet. And there are strong norms that, that encourage women to stay in the household rather than give them the option, do you want to stay in the household or do you want to to work outside, I know. I, I think that is an important conversation to have in development because of the ways that it, it limits not just opportunity for those women, but I mean, it can kind of wind up holding back that society as a whole. There was a really interesting report um, by the IMF, maybe close to ten years ago. Now they did it, but um, it and I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but basically they estimate the GDP losses that countries undergo by preventing such a significant portion of their workforce from pursuing their kind of highest valued opportunity. So there's this set of countries, the, the set of countries like the 15 or 20 or so that are most restrictive to women, um, you know, many of them in North Africa or in the Middle East where you have to get your husband's permission to work, you have to get your husband's permission to leave the country, um, you know, all these things. They estimate like sometimes 50% additional GDP they could have that is being foregone by not permitting this. Um, so you might've been asking more about the personal than the big picture, but I think, I think it's huge for both. And I think there's a misunderstanding that economic independence, sometimes people characterize that as just how you get your money, but it really is also how you choose to live your life. You know, and, and if you're beholden for your economic future on just kind of staying in the, the neighborhood or the farming community, whatever it is that you grew up in, that limits your life opportunities, your intellectual opportunities um, in all kinds of ways that go far beyond just how, what kind of work you're doing during the day. Excellent. Thanks so much, Diego and Jamie. Brian, please, yeah. Good, lots of interesting stuff. Um, so I have a couple of comments and then some point to literature I'll put in the chat. Uh, firstly, in something that maybe is already in your dissertation somewhere or the literature you're working from, just seems quite interesting to compare the legal framework for marriage versus the legal frameworks that are provided for business partnerships. Because clearly part of what you seem to be working towards or trying to think about is, okay, how do you, Think about this in terms of what's possible in a set of more equal relationships and that's where okay wait a minute compared to how women were treated you had all kinds of legal efforts to let you know brothers or father and brother or unrelated people you know work together to co-produce in a business partnership in a way that could leave a lot of things much less defined than uh, in a joint stock company or something um the second thing which you've really started to get into um, in your response last time is reading the paper, putting this into this larger question of the shift to companionate marriage, you know, marriage for love and the aspiration, you know, your marital partner should be your best friend and help meet and everything. And 
that would sort of seem to fit in something you, I think you could point to even more strongly in terms of, you say, the concern of both Eleanor Ostrom and Zelizer about agency and problem solving. And, you know, it's not just that, okay, having financial options or earning your own money creates the possibility of not just being dependent or having to make a material decision, but what is the pull factor, the attraction that people get attracted to the idea of companionate marriage and to broaden your paper's context beyond just the Western part of a weird framework, it seems like there ought to be some interesting literature out there in terms of particularly um, Indian Americans, because I certainly know from knowing and talking to some of them, you have a bunch of smart, well-educated people, some of whom decide to go ahead with arranged marriage or kind of hybrid negotiated things in a context of arranged marriage, which is somewhat different from, I think, some of the standard assumptions that may be implicit in a lot of the you know North American or European context. Thank you. And again, I'll do the chat for a couple things. Good. Yeah, thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, yeah, there, there's certainly many, many different ways that marriage is constituted and thought of around the world. And I think there's some, so this kind of gets into the psychology literature, but which I always fear to wade too deep into just because I am not a psychologist, I'm not expert enough in it. Um, but I know there's some pushback also against this companionate ideal today in the sense that so many people often interpret it as meaning that your partner needs to be able to provide like your every social need or the marriage has failed somehow. So I think maybe that's another way to think of um, institutional alternatives, um, different conceptions of marriage. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of looking at, you know, the Indian case is interesting too for this conversation because of the way that practices around marriage, it's my understanding, still differ somewhat according to which caste you're a part of. Um, in addition to the great religious diversity that exists. So I think there would be enormous opportunity to do um, comparative analysis. I'd have to partner, of course, with um, some people who are um, more experts on, um, on Indian culture than I am, but I really like that idea. Likewise, Brian. Um, Thank you. Please, so the, uh, uh, oh, I, I, I can't tell who in the ocean room. Yeah, Eden, is that you? Hmm. I'm not sure. You guys can you guys can figure this out, but please, oh, yes, push them room. <laughs> Say you're you're okay. It's unmuted. Okay, so um, so uh, I have a question about uh, the the future of uh, institution of of, of uh, families. Um, the, there is a book that you probably know that uh, looks at the at the history of marriage and 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 one of the of the of the arguments there is that. Marriage was not a thing until the until humankind until the agricultural uh, revolution, and then uh, because we became an agricultural uh, society, marriage was uh, helpful for, for for that, and this is why it became this way. And then you you mentioned the industrial uh, uh, revolution, chain stuff, and today that. Uh, a part, at least a part of the population is no longer economically dependent. So there is a change in the needs and preferences, but uh, the norms of the society didn't ad adapt yet. So what I'm trying to ask, if you're looking into the, into, into the future, at least for this part of the population that marriage is no longer an economic needs, and let's say that then societal norms catching up. Do, do you have a, uh, an idea of how it will look like? Oh my gosh. Um, prediction, prediction of these things is so hard. I mean, I, I do, the, the general trend I think has been towards marriage being seen as always less essential 
less necessary, kind of more optional. There are people who have long-term partnerships that never choose to legally marry. Um, there, you know, it's more socially acceptable to have, at least in most circles, it's more socially acceptable to have uh, children without necessarily being married. Um, and also divorce and re I mean, divorce and remarriage used to be a major stigma. Um, it was like a, a source of social shame to, to marry someone who had been previously married and still had a living spouse. So I think the general trend has been towards um, deprioritizing coupling, but it also doesn't seem to be going away, despite the fact that it's not really economically necessary. It's no longer necessary to form a long-term partnership, even in order to have you know, personal intimacy, um, people still do continue to, to pair off. So, I mean, this might get to, you, you know, you took us all the way back to the start of agriculture. This might get into um, more into deep anthropology than is my area of expertise, kind of what is this, this human desire to pair off? Because it also, it doesn't seem to be going away, despite the fact that all the things that were seen in the past as forcing it um, have more or less faded away. And by the way, in these comments, I'm not advocating for one particular future or another, but just observing what the trends are. So I don't know, I could see it continuing to go that direction. Um, it may be also something, a case where traveling in that direction is only possible during periods of high economic growth because people also need to be able to feel financially secure going off on their own, and that might not be possible during periods of economic stagnation. So it may kind of depend on, you know, how are we going to continue to see significant rises in economic productivity? Are, are we reaching like the apex of what humanity is capable of producing given the resource constraints of the globe? Or are we just continue, gonna continue to travel up that hockey stick of human growth you know, until we're, you know, colonizing deep space. So I don't, it, that, it gets into kind of, um, the, the last comment I'll say on this is that marriage institutions do tend to be extraordinarily enduring. Um, so by far the most common is like the patriarchal family structure that has existed for like millennia. Um, you know, the, the fundamental structure of marriage, you, we can still identify it today from how it would have looked in ancient Mesopotamia. So it does seem to be an institution that even though the details change quite a lot and the details matter greatly to us, there seems to be something about the structure that is just universal. There are extraordinarily few societies that don't have some form of marriage or long-term partnership. Excellent. I know there's a lot of folks that we want to get to in the next 10 minutes or so, but was there anybody else in the Ostrom room that wanted to interject at this point? Okay. Okay. We can always come back, guys. Um, I think so. Yeah. Christina. And then uh, Jamie had another one as well. Please. Hi, Jamie. Uh, this might be a very weird idea maybe totally off it just came to my mind and i know nothing about those cultures when men can have more women well, women can have more husbands how money and love and marriage is related there i'm just curious to hear your thoughts yeah um that the you know polygamy with women being the the individuals who are okay to have multiple partners but men are not we just don't see that a lot because of the biology because men's reproduction works so much faster than women's um usually most societies ration you know most social institutions are structured in a way that kind of rations women's sexuality more carefully you would never do anything that would kind of leave additional women discarded just speaking from like like a 
like a population persistence kind of perspective. So I think that that's why polygamy the other way around is a lot more common, um, which that also connects to broader social institutions in a lot of interesting ways because like for example, um, what you see in fundamentalist um, Mormon communities is you get discarded excess men. And one of the things that discarded excess men are is extremely dangerous. <laughs> Um, so there, you, there's a violent, you know, great potential for, for violence. Um, the, you know, the best case scenario is kind of, is like a mental health crisis among that population. But the worst case is, you know, such significant dissatisfaction that you get some kind of major political revolt. So I think any kind of institution that would require or strongly encourage polygamy, especially of an asymmetric nature where it's all, either only men or only women that kind of lead the harem or whatever terminology you want to use. Um, I think those are probably going to be unstable systems, politically speaking. Not my primary area of expertise, but just based on the, um, you know, the history that I have read about those institutions. Thank you. Yeah, just absolutely fascinating and great intersections there with a variety of other um, interests, frankly, core to the workshop as well. So um, yeah, Evan, please. And, oh, and and so I'm so yeah, maybe Evan, then we'll turn back to Jamie. Sorry. Fascinating uh, topic, I guess. <laughs> said. Um, I was thinking, what, what about your thoughts were on what about when norms change um, and you have um, over time will happen in personal relationships. As, so, so if you have people that were married 30, 40 years ago and you had these economic relations that were expected, and now you have, I mean, you see these high divorce rates among people in the 60s, or 50s, 70s. Um, do you have any thoughts about how norms and enforcement of ex third party actors are changing how individuals internalize their understanding of the relationship with their partners leading to possibly divorce in marriage. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, there was in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge spike in divorce rates. And part of this was because people who either legally or culturally had wanted to get divorced 20 or 30 years ago. Now, you know, as divorce law opened up, they now had the opportunity to be able to do so. So there was a lot of panic kind of in the, in the eighties. And I think continuing into the early nineties that people feared these divorce rates would just kind of continue to rise forever. And it was the end of marriage. They didn't, it was a spike with all these people who now had this, um, institutional alternative available to them that had been denied before. You, know, you don't really know if people want to stay in that marriage, if there's no way for them to get out either way. Um, so, but anyway, divorce rates did not continue to rise forever. They leveled off um, and have been pretty, pretty constant. Um, but I, I do think, you know, one of the areas in which I've thought about this question of you know, people often begin, you know, if they don't partner up early in their life, they at least have often their first partnerships within the first half of their life. And so they are probably developing their ideas about what a long-term partnership means and should be kind of during that time. Um, so then what happens now when you're interacting in a world where the the norms have changed where what's acceptable has changed even just since i started grad school which was well prior to the me too movement i've witnessed enormous difference in the norms for interaction between men and women in professional settings. Um, some people could argue that's not always for the good. I, I don't think it's great, for example, if um, 
senior academics feel so uncomfortable being seen with a young woman because they're afraid of what might be suggested that they're unwilling to mentor. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how big of a problem that is quantitatively speaking, um, but, and this, so I'm just trying to do a, a positive analysis here rather than making normative judgments, but I do think an enormous number of older academics just found, have found that extraordinarily troubling and difficult to, to navigate. They're confused why things that were okay before aren't okay anymore or might get them into trouble. I, I think this is the reason why um, some people within academia are just like having a huge problem and strong reaction to like diversity trainings, which, you know, I've attended the ones at my university in my view, they're like pretty short and uncontroversial, but some people find them very upsetting. So I, I'm, I guess I'm maybe giving you more problems than answers, but I do think, you know, within lifetimes, there can be pretty significant changes in the norms that have to be adapted to. And I think one of the shifts that's happened in the past 10 or 15 years is that the change in norms wasn't big enough that people had to adapt or they would lose their power. Now it's big enough that you have to adapt or you risk losing your power, losing your position. So kind of the, the rubber is, is meeting the road. Um, and without giving the, any answers, I do think just recognizing that as a source of tension that is being renegotiated can maybe be helpful in having a productive conversation around it rather than a conversation where people are simply blamed for having the wrong view. Um, no, we need, to, we need to renegotiate how we interact rather than have just a, you know, a series of violent coups over and over in, in terms of who's in cultural power. Indeed. And Jamie, I should have asked at the beginning, can you stay after for like a few minutes if we can't finish up everything? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to get to as many as we can. And as folks need to drop off, obviously, in a couple of minutes here, please feel free to do so. Okay. But we'll, we'll formally thank you again in a couple of minutes before we do that. Um, but Jamie Carini, you've been very patient. So let me, let me loop back to you. Um, okay. and, then, and then I think Brian, please. Thanks. I really wanted to get to Jamie Lemke's question about you know, other Ostrom scholarship to consider. Um, and a couple of pieces came to mind. One, I saw on page 18, you referenced the idea of covenant. And so Barbara Allen wrote, um, wrote a book on covenants and Tocquevillianism, which might actually be great, which might be helpful and useful. I, I want to read it. Um, but just know that the idea of covenants does work its way through um, Ostrom thought, especially like Barbara Allen and, and Vincent. I just don't remember where Vincent speaks of it in particular. Um, another thing that I was thinking about too was, I think it's because it's influenced by my own, own work. So, you know, take this as, as, a, as a personal bias, but I've been thinking a lot about like complex systems, which, which tap into this idea of orders rather than institutions. And sometimes I wonder if we look th at things through an institutional lens, when maybe it, the lens of like a type of order might be help just as helpful or might even help us understand a bit more how, how things interact. So the idea of money and economics, while they might clash at an, or money and love, while it might clash at an institution level, institutional level, maybe it's more resolved. Maybe they resolve a little bit better if we think of them as part of being this complex system or this complex order. Um, emerging from emerging from negotiation and, and discussion and contestation. Thank you so much. That's interesting framing. I'll have to I'll have to think about that more. And of course, thank you for that. Um, I will definitely um, get that Barbara Allen book. It sounds fascinating. For sure. Um, and, and just since we're at the one o'clock point Eastern, let, let's just go ahead and thank Jamie again, and then we'll continue the conversation. I promise Brian and others. Okay. But really, really well done. <laughs> this is fascinating work, Jamie. Thank, so thank you, you so much. I really appreciate all these very helpful notes. So thank you. Oh yeah. And if we haven't already done this, um, uh, in terms of an invitation to feature you in the podcast, then that could be really fun. Um, oh. we have this governance roundtable of the Ostrom workshop 